I love your jacket. Henry Bowman is my very favorite pattern. Thank you. This is Carol Merritt at the Atlanta History Center on uh, Tuesday, January 10, uh, getting ready to interview Nan Pendergrast. So, welcome. Glad you're able to come today. We're look for looking forward to what well, you have to share. You. Good to see you again. What I'd like you to do maybe in starting out is just give me something about your background, who you are, where you came from, something about your parents. Well, I came from right here, and it was tremendously advantageous during the Civil Rights struggle. Uh, actually, you couldn't be more from here than I am. My mother's mother was born in Atlanta during the Battle of Atlanta and born in the basement because the Yankees were occupying the rest of the house. So where was this? Where where in Atlanta? In Atlanta, 1864, I think it was. Okay. And uh, so she came in handy. I never knew her. She had a real talent for doing things the hard way. <laughs> After getting born during her battle, she grew up, married, and produced, among her other children, three consecutive sets of twins, <laughs> of whom my mother was half of one. But I never knew her because, understandably, she died of total exhaustion in her forties. However, my job with Hope, which I guess we'll get to later, mm -hmm. was to talk to the Civic Club to explain to the Kiwanis, the Optimists, the Rotarians that segregated schools were illegal and that they had to open the schools to everybody. <coughs> And invariably, the first thing you were asked was, where do you come from anyway? You don't really understand the situation. So I exhumed my grandmother at every time, <laughs> and she came in very handy. Well, had you been born here in Atlanta yes. also, and your mother as well? And my mother was born here, and I married to a man who was born here. So we've okay. been around about as long as anybody. Okay. Um, so, um, maybe back up just a little bit. Before you even got involved in HOPE, you weren't new to community kinds of organizations. What, what kind of involvement and community involvement did you have even before 59? Well, may I back up a little and tell you why I got involved in the first place? I can't remember from the age of four on I knew that the racial situation was illogical and cruel and just all wrong. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know where to go with this feeling until I got to college in Poughkeepsie, New York. I went to Vassar and my freshman year, one of our speakers was Walter White, who was head of the NAACP. I went to hear him and he explained that he was from Atlanta and he mentioned the race riots, of which, of course, I had never heard. That was a secret nobody talked about. And that he would never come back to Atlanta again. He had left shortly afterward. And when he finished speaking, I came up and said, Oh, Mr. White, I'm from Atlanta, and how naive could I get? I said, I, I think things are getting much better. You should come <laughs> home and give us another chance. This would have been in about 1937. And he was a gentle man, and he just said, I don't really know that they've changed all that much. Why don't you go home and change them? And it was with this impetus that I came back when I was 21 finished college and I came back home, married the boy around the block, and began to look for some way to try to change. And uh, it was very difficult. There just was a, an implacable wall between the two communities. I'm not sure I ever would have made my way had my brother and sister not gone to Sun Valley to ski. <laughs> There was a Swiss restaurant keeper there who wrote, they kept in touch with, and he wrote them and said, I have a friend who's coming to Atlanta. I 
an anthropologist from South Africa, and I have given her your name and number. So my sister-in-law called me somewhat in a panic and said, Good heavens, I've had to ask her to tea, but I've no idea what to talk about to a South African anthropologist, and you don't know enough to shut up any time, so why don't you come? So I came to tea and uh, met the lady. Her name was Dr. Ellen Heldman, and she was staying at Atlanta University. And when I took her back after tea, I had the opportunity to meet the dean, Josephine Murphy, I think her name was, and I explained that I wanted to join some organization where I could meet and possibly change things. And it was very easy. Within a week, I was a member of the Georgia Council on Human Relations, and we were working, several of us, on attempting to integrate the airport and the bus station. These were chosen because at the time we had no civil rights bill, but there was an interstate commerce bill which directed that any organization dealing with interstate travelers must accept any citizen. But it wasn't easy. <clears throat> I remember that George Goodwin and I went to call on the Atlanta Library Board because we decided to broaden out a little bit. And they kept telling us that they knew we were right, that the library should be integrated, but the time wasn't right and they were frightened. Well, the head of our group was a marvelous man named Whitney Young, who was a professor at AU. I'll give you a sense of what Whitney was like, that he came home once after a trip to Chicago and told the six of us who were on the board that he had progress to report at the airport. This, of course, was the old Atlanta airport. We said, really? He said, yes, you know that sign that has always said colored men? Well, the C and the ED have faded and nobody has bothered to repaint them. It now <laughs> says or men. Don't you think that could be considered gradual integration? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, Whitney kept more of a, a sense of humor and balance in this impossible situation than I did. I was who were some, by a guilty conscience. Who were some of the other people on the council? There was you, there, there was... There was a woman named Eliza Pascoe. Oh, yeah. And uh, George Goodwin. Okay. And others probably, but those are the only ones I can recall. Mm -hmm. And George and I were delegated to go call on the Atlanta Library Board and getting nowhere at all. But finally, Whitney called me, must have been after several months of absolutely futile integration, I mean, conversations with the library board. He said, we're getting ready to file suit. And I'm pretty sure it's a suit we can win. And how about you calling a friend? I just realized I messed something up. George Goodwin was not on the Georgia Council Board. Mm -hmm. He was on the Library Board. Oh, okay. And he was a friend. And I called him on a Monday and said, suit is going to be filed on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And he said, give us until Wednesday. And I hung up. They integrated <laughs> before Wednesday. Before the suit. Before the suit, which I guess they realized would be dreadful public relation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was the sort of thing that we worked toward. Mm -hmm. and it, we were a small group. We were nobody in particular. Okay. About what time, what year do you recall that I'm the board trying, was I knew I was get the library trouble. board? That's okay, we can always I find out. I can't out. remember exactly when it was, but I know that it was before the Civil Rights Bill. Right. And before the school frustration. Right, which came in 59. Well, when Atlanta 
faced, we knew in September that the first transfer students would attempt to integrate the school. And that as the laws of Georgia were written at the time, every school in Georgia would close. Because if one parent filed suit saying my school has been denied admission to a public school, then they would close down that public school. That's the way the laws were written. And at that point, other people throughout the state would say, this is discrimination. And within, we gathered a, a month or so, every school in the state would be closed if the transfer students were not admitted. Well, we had a horrible example of what happened if you didn't do something in, in Little Rock. And Little Rock was tearing itself up. And after some months of this, a citizens group headed by a lady, Adolphine Terry, who happened to be in the class of 1902 at Vassar. Wow, <laughs> Vassar's really involved. Yeah. So she, she got things moving in Little Rock and they eventually came to their senses. We were hoping in Atlanta to avoid anything quite so disastrous. So 17 of us founded a committee called HOPE. It was an acronym for Help Our Public Education. Do you recall the first meeting? <clears throat> I think I do, and I think it was in Muriel Loki's house. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was at her house. I recall my first awareness that anybody else was thinking about this when I went to pick up one of my children at Margaret Mitchell School and parked behind a car which had a, a printed slogan saying, We want public school. Mm -hmm. Well, I leaped out, <laughs> went to talk to the driver of the car. He said, where did you get that? That's wonderful. Her name was Maxine Friedman. Mm -hmm. And is, is Maxine still alive? You know? I don't know. Her husband had, was a professor at Tech. Okay. And Maxine was, unfortunately in this case, from New York City. Mm -hmm. And although she felt strongly, she was worried about the fact that people would say, this is an outsider, uh -huh. this is a meddler. Uh -huh. But I found out from her that there was a very small group who were interested in trying to keep the schools open and looking to see where we could go, what we could do. And we did meet at Muriel Loki's. And I understand Muriel has been interviewed and she can tell you more than I about yeah, she, she was interviewed last week and she said that she recalled that at the meeting you just appeared. She had not met you, I don't think, before yeah, then. Well, yeah, I, did. yeah. I thought we uh -huh. had known each other, but yeah. anyway, I'd known her husband for uh -huh. a long time. Yeah. The, the only one with any kind of official connection was Muriel's husband, who had been briefly, I don't think he still was, one of the state legislators. Mm -hmm. There were also a lot of degrees of opinion. We all wanted the schools kept open. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'd say that most of us felt that this was morally the thing to do. We had felt this way for a long time. There were others who just felt that it was legally necessary, as one of them put it, none too delicately. Halitosis is better than no breath at all. <laughs> well, for a while we were just the few of us talking to ourselves mostly. But then we talked to Ralph Miguel, and I'm sure that Mary will could tell you more about this too. But I know that, that Ralph was approaching, he occasionally would write columns that leaned in this direction, but he knew better, I guess, than to lead his readership too fast or too far. But he did write enough about the formation of this group, 
So that next thing we knew, we picked up an edition of Time magazine, and it was talking about hope. And my husband said, good heavens, I thought hope was you and Muriel Loki talking <laughs> on the telephone. <clears throat> but it, it began to pick up from there. Mm -hmm. And we were allowed to speak to the Civic Association. Which groups and, did you speak to, do you recall? Oh, I think to all of them, the Optimists, the Kiwanis, the Rotarians, I'm pretty sure I remember. And while they were all the Southern gentlemen enough not to hit me, <laughs> <laughs> nor even really to be terribly rude, they were just obviously not, not impressed. <laughs> I did not get the feeling that I had convinced much of anybody, but we kept trying. And I can't remember how much longer it was before we held our first public meeting at what is the Tower Theater, I think mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. And it was... Um, Fill the Tower with Hope. Yes. <laughs> and that was Hope's first public meeting. We okay. told people in the newspaper <coughs> what we wanted and we invited the public to come. Did you send out written notices or <coughs> distribute flyers? How did everybody I find out about it? I'm not sure. I hope <coughs> Muriel remembers. Mm -hmm. But we did what we could and we weren't sure whether anybody would come mm -hmm. or whether the antagonistic people would come. Mm -hmm. I know that I was ushering and it involved walking back and forth along the aisle. There were a lot of people there. We didn't know who many of them were. We did know who one of them was, and we were not happy about it. A man named George Bright, who was almost certainly the fellow who had either bombed or directed the bombing of the temple because the rabbi had made integrationist noises. Mm -hmm. And George Bright was there. He was being watched carefully by a lot of people, but he was there. And much later, I had a friend who interviewed George Bright to write a book. And she asked him bluntly if he had been the one who had bombed the temple. He said, no, if I had bombed it, it wouldn't have been at night. It would have been in, when there were people there. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> being watched, George didn't do anything that night. He didn't speak out. Ralph McGill himself was the main speaker. Mm -hmm. But of course, Ralph had been threatened with bombing and knew what else. I understand there was some security features about that meeting, that there were plainclothesmen there who were overseeing yes, to make true. sure that things were were safe. That That's what I knew. I don't know mm -hmm. who they were. I don't uh -huh. know if they were FBI or uh -huh. who they were. Yeah. But at any rate, there were no outcries. As far as I can remember, there were not even any disagreeable noises raised. At that meeting? At the meeting. Okay. And from then on, our governor, who had said previously that there would be no integration, not one student, backed off a little bit, and he appointed a man named J John Sibley, a very prominent uh, and head of a bank, several other things, his job was to go, and I don't know if he headed a commission or if it was just he. I think he must have had it a It was a commission. Mm -hmm. But he went to all ten of the congressional districts, held public meetings, mm -hmm. asked everybody to speak. I have no way of knowing, but from his past, I would have thought the governor expected the Sibley Commission to come back and say, no, not one ever. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, thanks a lot to Hope, mm -hmm. there were people in every one of the congressional districts mm -hmm. who spoke up and said, no, mm -hmm. 
we must integrate our school. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what happened when Hope people spoke down in Albany? I think the first uh, hearing was in Albany, and uh, evidently they were not really treated very fairly. And there's mm -hmm. a story. It would have been Francis Pauly, bless her heart, okay. I think. Uh -huh. well. yeah. <clears throat> Francis was, she looked like everybody's grandmother. Mm -hmm. She was impeccably Southern. Mm -hmm. And didn't hesitate to go down. She had gone down before on behalf of the councils on human relations. Mm -hmm. And she survived for a long time. In fact, I think Francis just died last year at about 96. Mm -hmm. But she had courage. I always felt that those of us who operated within Atlanta, Metropolitan Atlanta, were were quite safe. I never so frightened about it. Mm -hmm. Although I would occasionally encounter hate tales. And what kind of encounters would you have as a result of your working with Hope? Oh, uh, I can remember being. The problem is that some of this is foggy. I don't remember what sort of a sign I was carrying downtown mm -hmm. when I was simply looked at with pure hatred. Mm -hmm. People didn't say much. The truth is that all during this, I never had anybody confront me face to face and say, you're wrong, mm -hmm. because I think they knew we were right. Mm -hmm. Uh, no they, friends, no neighbors, no, no friends, strangers. Uh, telephone calls. Oh, okay. And particularly telephone calls answered by my then 16-year-old daughter with the usual question. How would your mother like you to marry a nigger? Mm -hmm. But that was as close as it came. Mm -hmm. I have always felt that at least speaking for myself, I got a great deal more credit for courage than I deserved. Mm -hmm. I simply did what had to be done. Mm -hmm. I can remember being very nervous on, well, the occasion of that meeting at the Tower Theater, mm -hmm. wondering what would happen next. Mm -hmm. And the actual day of the first integrated school, there were newspaper people from all over the world, literally, mm -hmm. coming to see what would happen next. And uh, I was nervous, and mm -hmm. what happened, bless its heart, was what one of them headlined, a stillness in Atlanta. <laughs> mm -hmm. and the students were integrated, there was no problem about it. Mm -hmm. Of course, Speaking for myself again, I felt that it was the worst possible plan to integrate, to begin with the seniors in high school, mm -hmm. and to have so few of them. But at the, when they should have started in kindergarten, mm -hmm. before children had been taught to hate and right. fear. Mm -hmm. Someone else would know better than I whether there were actually vicious encounters in the schools or not. Mm -hmm. I understand that there were some really hard times for those students that did integrate. Do you recall going to the legislature, um, and I think Senator uh, Russell was visiting that day, and I think you all sat up in the balcony. We sat in the balcony. Yeah, tell me that story. Well, actually I I have always found the legislature extremely confusing. <laughs> Primarily with a lot of jackasses talking and a lot of others not listening anyway. Mm -hmm. So all that I actually remember was being there and somehow identifying ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't recall that the legislature recognized we were there. Did they? Do you know? I understand that you all had signs mm -hmm. that you hid, but then I think when Russell came in, mm -hmm. those on the first floor stood up. <laughs> you all remained seated, but you pulled your signs out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was 
the whole thing, I, I think credit ought to be given here a little bit. One of the schools integrated was Northside School, okay. which is now North Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And as it happened, the president of the student body that year was a guy named Jim Martin. And Jim is now running for lieutenant governor. Oh, okay. oh I hope he'll win. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jim, uh, they were, I think, egged on a little bit. Didn't need too much egging, but they had a gathering during the summer, a party, uh -huh. at which some of the current students at North Atlanta invited the transfer students, by then they knew who they were, okay. to come to meet each other and to have a party. And when school started, the transfer students had friends. Okay. There were some people who knew them, and Jim uh -huh. Martin was one of them who was the leader of it. I have never seen him given publicly as much credit as I thought he deserved. Mm -hmm. This is a high school senior. Mm -hmm. So how did Hope support itself financially? Mm -hmm. How was it organized? How <laughs> I never was sure it was organized at uh, all. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not I think we all paid for whatever we were trying uh -huh. to do. Uh -huh. well, while I'm giving credit to a high school student, I would like to mention that my son John, who was 16 and was a senior in high school, spoke before the commission when they came to Atlanta, pleading oh. for the schools to be kept open. Okay. And uh, John was, I think, of particular interest because he was the star student of the year. Nobody could say he was stupid uh -huh. and didn't know. But he was pleading on behalf of his five younger siblings that they have a school to go to. Uh -huh. Don't shut the school. Right. Does he still have his statement before the commission? I don't know. I don't have it. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure that he wrote it. I'll, I'll ask him. Okay. He's a professor now and he lives in Canada. but. He, Yet he was home last week. Uh -huh. I wish I'd known to ask him then. Yeah. He did, of course, remember the situation. Uh -huh. You say that you knew John Sibley, the oh, yes. man who... So that was a good choice for to head that commission then. Well, as I said, I don't think that the governor knew when he appointed him how good a choice he would be. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that he'd married a Vassa girl, too. Mm -hmm. And, of course, later, I'm, I guess I'm mixing up a, a lot of situation, but, of course, you will know that our mayor, Ivan Allen, spoke in Congress and asked that the Civil Rights Bill mm -hmm. be passed. Mm -hmm. He was the only Southern government mm -hmm. official who spoke. Mm -hmm. Probably just a coincidence, but he was married to a Vassar girl, too. Well, you just can't beat those Vassar women. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, speak out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, what did you feel generally about the Sibley Commission? What I wasn't, and, frankly, too hopeful to start with. Okay. I knew John Sibley, but I he was older, he was in my father's generation, he was a friend of my father's. Mm -hmm. I really only talked to him when I went to collect money for the League of Women Voters okay. from the trust company. Oh, okay. But uh, I knew his children, his daughter Jeanette was a friend of mine. Okay. But I wasn't sure how he would feel about me. Uh -huh. and I didn't know if I talked about the League of Women Voters either, because I was pretty careful what I said. Yeah. No, it was it was a wonderful surprise, and I think a huge step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. but, but what if, you can tell me what happened in Albany? I can't remember. If I Evidently, in Albany, um, the those who spoke didn't get as much they didn't get the fair hearing that they thought they were going to get and that then hope approached Sibley oh. and 
you know, complained about it. And they, and, and what the, the upshot was that he made sure that people were heard, people who had something to say, had an equal chance to, to be heard, so they considered him very, very fair. Um, you had mentioned the League of Women Voters. Yeah. Tell me how you got involved with the League of Women Voters and what they did, what you did with them. And uh, Well, I was uh, an officer of the League. My primary job was collecting money. It always seemed to you be... You were the treasurer? I was a treasurer for okay. a while, at least. Okay. But it was... We had, of course, only white women voters. Mm -hmm. And somewhat later, I think it was quite a bit later, I was no longer on the board. I had left the league because I wanted to be free to back certain candidates. And the mm -hmm. league's rule was that as an officer, you could not back a candidate. The mm -hmm. members were. But so I was not actually an officer at the time that the issue came up that some of the League women said we should have members of all races. Any any voter who wants to come in should be able mm -hmm. to join us. Mm -hmm. The president of the League, whom I shall be kind enough not to name, <laughs> was very much opposed to this. And I do remember that it was enough of an issue, so we called a special meeting at the old women's club to discuss the issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I know that I spoke in favor of opening our membership to all who would come and urging people to come. Mm -hmm. It was written up in the newspaper. I guess a vote was taken either there or shortly thereafter. And in spite of our president, we voted to let other people in. Mm -hmm. Just one step at a time, we begin to see progress. Mm -hmm. Not, of course, that I don't realize that there is still a tremendous amount to be done. Mm -hmm. So, what was the relationship between the League of Women Voters and HOPE? Did, was the League supportive of HOPE's efforts? You know, I can't remember. I would have expected them to be. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was on both boards. Right. And I don't remember. I just can't remember the issue. The mm -hmm. league was awfully careful about yeah. endorsing almost anything and right. wouldn't endorse any candidate. Right. Well, now, how did you feel, though, when the issue came up about hopes, exclusion or inclusion of blacks? Uh, well, I or how did you feel about the fact that Hope did exclude blacks? Well, I understood absolutely the reasoning behind our remaining Lily White. Mm -hmm. It was because we felt we could be much more effective mm -hmm. and persuasive if these were white parents who wanted the schools open. Right. And everybody knew that black parents were going to open. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason. It was not that yeah. we were meaning to exclude anybody. It was simply in an effort to make ourselves as palatable as possible right. and as persuasive. But I do remember that at the time we lost at least one member of our small board who said he would not be a member of any organization. Who was that? His name was Harry Boyd. He's long dead. Okay. But he had always been active in promoting race relations. Right. And I think he maybe made himself a rule that he would not yeah. help to anybody or have any part of any organization mm -hmm. that was Lily White. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that anybody else. Right. I think Francis Pauley was concerned about it. Mm -hmm. and started not really? to join, but then in thinking about it and talking, she said with Donald Hollowell, he said, well, no, go ahead on, because you're needed in that in that fight. I didn't realize that Harry had anybody on his side. I, I certainly uh, wasn't. I, yeah. I thought I, it just seemed ridiculous mm -hmm. to say that a group such as ours who mm -hmm. was striving to integrate the schools and 
society in general, I guess, could be accused of being racist. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, what would have been the scenario for education for blacks and whites if hope had not fought for public education? I'm afraid that in the climate as it was, mm -hmm. the school where black students attempted to enter would have been closed because mm -hmm. that was what the law said. Mm -hmm. And I cannot at this moment recall the exact legality by which all the schools in the state would be closed because if this one school were mm -hmm. discriminatory, than all were. Uh -huh. oh. okay. So we may have lost our public schools, and that right. happened in some Prince George County in Virginia, Virginia. I think, uh -huh. and maybe others, uh -huh. I'm not certain. What's your assessment of where Atlanta is today? Atlanta's always been, well, in terms of its uh, public education, what's but, your assessment? Well, it's, of course, my children are all grown up now mm -hmm. and out of school. I have grandchildren in the Decatur public schools, okay. and the schools are, of mm -hmm. course, completely integrated. I think maybe it's about 50-50. Okay. I don't know that there's a great deal of, I don't know, that there are clubs, for instance, my granddaughter is a member of the drill team, and I didn't even know what a drill team was, but it, it's not quite cheerleaders, but it's very close. And of the team, there's one black girl, and there are, I think, about 20 whites. Mm -hmm. But I, I wish I could say that it had all melded together, but it hasn't, of course. Mm -hmm. we, we have isn't the word resegregation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we have black neighbors now, and okay. that was something that I would not have foreseen. Mm -hmm. And the, the attitudes have changed so. Mm -hmm. When these, we've lived in our house for 51 years, when these people moved in, about three years ago now, mm -hmm. we have beehives, and I went over to take them a pot of honey in to welcome them, and found that other neighbors had brought cakes and had made them feel very welcome indeed. So uh, I think that there is an improvement, mm -hmm. and when I suggested to my neighborhood garden club that I would like to ask this woman to join us, mm -hmm. There was no objection, whatever. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to join us. She was too busy, <laughs> so she never came in. Mm -hmm. So I see, well, I guess I'd better explain that I am absolutely, implausibly optimistic, always. <laughs> you're just born that way or you're not. Mm -hmm. So that even when I was a child and knew how wrong things were, I, mm -hmm had the feeling that they were going to change, they had to change. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, how did you, as a very young child, how did it happen that you, that's how you felt about well, race and integration? Because, as a very young child, I saw that the servants in our neighborhood, and I was brought up in Druid Hills and everybody had help, mm -hmm. they did all the work and the white folks got all the money. There was something wrong with it. It was also totally irrational at the time. Black people were considered responsible enough to care for our children, clean enough to cook our food, but the world would come to an end if you sat next to one on a bus. Did that make any sense at all? It didn't take more than a four-year-old to see that. <laughs> and I was very fortunate in the, the help we had in our house. Mm -hmm. Very important to me. 
I was closer to them in some ways than to my parents. They took How so? Well, if I fell and scraped my knee, I didn't run to my mother for a band-aid. I ran to Louise, the maid. Or, and uh, I, I just, we had a lot of back-and-forth conversation, in particular we had a 16-year-old young man who came to work for the family as a chauffeur, I think, who stayed with us for 24 years. And John was my surrogate father. I adored him. And he loved me. In fact, we used to play a game when he was working around the house. We'd play. I was the mama. <laughs> He always called me Mother Dearest. <laughs> so he was the child. Yeah, he okay. was the child. Uh -huh. We had a wonderful time bossing around. Of course, he really wasn't, and we knew that. Uh -huh. And his ma his uh, wife was the maid. Uh -huh. And I think he married her when he'd been with us about 11 years. But uh -huh. Louise and John were there for many, many years. What were their name? Were their last names? Louise Pounds. P O U N D S. Okay. And when my father died, oh, he died as a result of a fall from a horse when he was about fifty-six. Uh -huh. And my mother did not hear it all well, and we children were grown, and she sold the house where we lived and moved into a, an apartment. And at that time, John and Louise went to New York to work for a friend of my mother. Okay. And they moved on from working for the friend to an actress. And John would come home to see his own parents now and then, and he'd always come to see us too and tell us about his life now. He had served Clark Gable now a few nights okay. before. Uh -huh. But when he became very old and he and Louise were ready to retire, in fact, Louise had Alzheimer's, they moved back to Atlanta. And I was charged with finding them the proper lodging. Uh -huh. And I did, so that for the last 10, 12 years of his life, we became very close again. Uh -huh. And uh, actually, I. I was with him the day before he died. Mm -hmm. He was very old by mm -hmm. then. But he remained as close as we had been as children. Mm -hmm. Well, so now, while you were involved in Hope, what was your observation or where, what was your view of the Atlanta student movement? The students that started the sit-ins and the various protests that began to open up public accommodations in Atlanta. Totally sympathetic. Mm -hmm. And uh, very much upset. By that time my father had died. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned that the business community was so very slow mm -hmm. to integrate. And I went to see several friends of my father's who were very influential to see if I couldn't get them to do better than that. Mm -hmm. and in fact, one of them was the vice president of Coca-Cola. And I remember going to talk to him about it. Did said, you want to share who, who that was? His name was Harrison Jones. Okay. And I went to talk to Harrison Jones, and he listened very politely. He was a good friend. And he said, I said, my father isn't here for me to ask him, but why is the business community slow? What can we do? Mm -hmm. And he said, it's coming. I know it is. The things you're working for are coming. Mm -hmm. He knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And he said, but there are going to be tomatoes and rotten eggs thrown at the people who do the things you're doing, and I don't want that to happen to you. I, 
I don't know whether that's the way your father would have been felt or not, but I think it probably would be, and that's mm -hmm. how I feel too. Just mm -hmm. back off and wait for it to mm -hmm. happen, but don't be in the forefront. Okay. Okay, so, um, what is your assessment of Atlanta, a city too busy to hate? <laughs> Afraid I always felt it was an overstatement. <laughs> and yet, I, it is my hometown, and I have gloried in every step forward that we have taken. And I brought you a group of letters from the leaders of the black community who were friends. That's something I definitely want to mention, that mm -hmm. in the beginning, when I first began to try to work with them, I was touched at how welcome I was always made to feel in the black community. Mm -hmm. I became a member of the board of the local branch of the NAACP. Uh, when did that happen? Well, I know that Julian Bond was the head of it at the time. Okay. I don't remember the exact date. Okay. And I was on the board of the Urban League. And always, when Grace Hamilton was there? Hmm? When Grace Hamilton was a, was a theater? Yes, I knew okay. Grace Hamilton. Uh -huh. And always made to feel totally welcome and at home. And always painfully aware of the fact that I could go to that church and everything would be fine, but that if they came to mine, uh -huh. there would be trouble. Uh -huh. so In fact, do you remember the when the the churches, elected churches, were picketed and people sat in. I think there was a Ashton Jones, a, a white minister who was actually put in jail. Yeah. Do you oh, remember that whole period? I do. And by that time, I had found the one church where this didn't matter. I became a Quaker. <laughs> we were a very small group then, but always they were the church which welcomed anybody and everybody. What had been your church? Oh, Lord. I'd gone around, I'd sampled quite a few of okay. them. Okay. <laughs> we had, I think at the time, we were being Episcopalians. Okay. Although we, we never joined. I paid my dues by teaching the two-year-old class for 22 straight years. Uh, okay. <laughs> because I usually had at least one child in it. Mm -hmm. And my husband sang in the choir, but uh -huh. we, we didn't do it. And we were always looking for some church who would do it. And so, what was this Quaker congregation? Well, it was a very small group. Very few of them, what they call birthright Quakers. There uh -huh. were almost none who had been born in uh -huh. the church. Uh -huh. But there were people who had joined the church because they were looking for peace people and tolerant people and they found it. And we were too small and too poor to have a meeting house for quite a while, but the Philadelphia Quakers got together the money and bought us a house on, Oak, on Fairview Road in Druid Hills, mm -hmm. Quaker House. Mm -hmm. And I remember we, the, so far as I know, the first integrated classroom in Atlanta long before the schools were a small art class taught in the basement of Quaker House where there were five students. Two of them were my children, Blair and Scott, our fifth and sixth. Mm -hmm. And two of them were Martin and Coretta's children. And I can't remember who that fifth one was, okay. but it was. Do you recall when this was approximately? Well, let me back up a little bit. How old were your children when they were? Blair and Scott were about four and six. Uh -huh. And they were born in 52 and 54. Okay, so even before Hope got started and the crisis in the public schools, there had been an integrated class. Yes. Okay, yeah, this was it. Yeah. I don't know if there were any others. And mm -hmm. These five little children getting together once a week to study art. 
probably didn't really qualify. But later, in, in years later, Blair was, that was the child who was six then, was at Emory University. She would have been a junior. And she did an interview with Andrew Young. And it was printed in the Emory newspaper. And Andrew spoke of the fact that when he came to Atlanta from New Orleans, the only place where white people made him feel welcome was Quaker House. Oh. Okay. Oh, wonderful. So is that, was that your entry into the peace movement? Yes, although I guess I'd always been a pacifist too. Mm -hmm. So then I know during World War II, I collected clothing for Germans and Americans and sent it to the children wherever I could. Okay. I don't remember how it happened, but I know there was a mention of it in the newspaper because uh -huh. I still got the clipping that said so. But just as I didn't think segregation made any sense, I certainly knew war didn't. <laughs> And Iraq is the latest one we've been arguing about. Mm -hmm. So you're still involved there? Oh, yes. Very much in it. And our son John, the one who spoke to the Sibley Commission, was a conscientious objector. And my husband was a conscientious objector in World War II, which was rather a lonely position. Luckily, he was saved by asthma from having to be anything at all. <laughs> you know, but uh, John went to Canada and lives there still. So uh, there was always a connection, it seemed to mm -hmm. me, between those who felt racism, racism was wrong and war didn't make any sense either. Mm -hmm. I do not know how many of the other people who were involved in HOPE became active in anti-war during Vietnam or not. I do remember that one of them, religious people had trouble with this. One of the early members of HOPE was a, man, a young lawyer in Atlanta named Lanier Randolph. And Lanier's father came from South Georgia his father was, I think, a Baptist minister. I'm not certain which minister. And he said that his father said, I'm sorry, I got an itchy eye. Oh, okay. His father said, well, son, I know what the Lord wants me to do. I've prayed over it. I know he wants me to take this stand that you've taken. And son, I just can't stand it. <laughs> oh, that. It, it was terribly difficult. Uh -huh. And strangely enough, it was this <coughs> same dean at Atlanta University, Josephine Murphy, mm -hmm. who tried to explain to me. I said, I don't understand how so many people that I know to be kind, people who would never hurt anybody personally, mm -hmm. can remain racist. She said, well, maybe I can help explain to you with something that happened here at school. We had a Chinese student at Atlanta University. And when he graduated and went on for graduate work in Chicago, we kept in touch. And he told me excitedly that he was engaged to be married. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Tell me about the girl. He said, well, I've never met her. My parents have selected her for me. And Dean Murphy said to me, I wanted to say to him, good heavens, your parents are crazy. Can't you shape them up? And he said, now when I realized that I was telling him to renounce everything his parents taught and that this was very difficult. You can't do that. And so a lot of the people whom you know feel that to come out for integration would be to renounce everything their parents and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. I thought this had not occurred to me. Mm -hmm. 
I know that sometime during it, we knew a teacher who was a German refugee. Mm -hmm. He taught at Georgia Tech, and he said that he had spoken to his class and said, when there is integration, it, it does not disturb me at all. But how would you feel if down the line a black student was at Georgia Tech? Mm -hmm. And he said, they said, we wouldn't mind at all. I'd be all right. And he said, how would your parents feel? And they all said they would be horrified. He said, well, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. They said, we're educated. Mm -hmm. There was a big difference. I, I don't. I have a feeling that my father always agreed with me. Mm -hmm. My mother did not. She, having a mother born during the battle marked her the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're about at the end of our our mm -hmm. interview, but is there anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, I'll probably think of 50 things when I get home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very much a part of my life. I can and see I'm that. And I'm very proud of the fact that our seven children have all come along with us. We haven't had a rebel. Yeah. And I think that they were all uh, very, very proud of what happened and very proud of the fact that I had played some small peripheral role in it. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you've led a very exemplary life, um, well, special, there. unique kind of life in And, and in having Atlanta. married the fellow around the block whose mm -hmm. parents never knew what he was about either. Ah, okay. was extremely fortunate. We've been married 65 years. Wow. And uh, I have always been very proud of him and actually he took early retirement from the manufacturing firm where he worked, and there was a very brief period before he embarked on a second career. Mm -hmm. And during that time, he served as a chairman of the Georgia Council on Human Relations, which was ah. out of the, we had lost our chairman, and so he helped out just for mm -hmm. a matter of months. Mm -hmm. But he's been, and he belonged to a group Back in the first career, business executives moved for Vietnam peace. Okay. So I think he has really had to show more courage than I did. Mm -hmm. so, well, I think both of you have just led, you know, just an incredibly important life. I think. Uh, and and to be associated with all these changes. And on. issues <laughs> in Atlanta. And to know all of them, you'll see the, the letters of most of them are planning a meeting or uh -huh. maybe thanking us for some small contribution. Okay. And that's Andrew Young. Right. You might want to, just on tape, mention this letter also that you pulled mm -hmm. off at first. Someone, a friend of ours, has recently written a book of which I've forgotten the title, mm -hmm. but it deals specifically with the sit-in and the students at Spelman College, where mm -hmm. he was a professor. Mm -hmm. And he's written a book in which he uses this letter from Martin. Oh, Harry Lefevre? Uh-huh, you know yeah, Harry. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh-huh. Don't tell yeah. Harry, I couldn't remember the name <laughs> of his book. <laughs> yeah, okay. And um, he borrowed this letter. Ah, okay. Well, in fact, go ahead. That's all right. I just think this is awfully important. And what I'd like to do is to make copies of the of the letters that you brought. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate your do you pulling that you together. Do you all have a printing machine that could make that behave any better? Well, we I, I know there's a copy machine right down the hall, mm -hmm. and I'll certainly try. I'll certainly try. Mm -hmm. That was a photograph taken by the Atlanta World fellow. Perry was a name. Oh, okay. Harmon Perry. Yeah, and I uh -huh. finally found him and said, can you make this a little clearer? And he said, I haven't gotten any idea where that film oh, was. Yeah. That was a million years ago. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you. 
for oh, you're being here and sharing with this project. Well, I you have an important story. You're one mm -hmm. of the important stories in Atlanta. Well, some, as I said, I feel that I was a very peripheral player. I don't, well, and in Atlanta, where it was safe to be. Uh, I went up to Vassar to speak on civil rights uh -huh. to the, I guess, the Alumni Council. Okay. And uh, they had the impression that I was the only living liberal south of the Mason Dixon <laughs> line, which of course wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. And we've been very co connected with Vassar. Three of the children went there. Uh -huh. Back and forth. This has nothing to do with integration, but I just happened to have a picture of the group. Huh. Oh, it was our family up at Highlands last year. Okay, you want to hold that up? Let me see. Oh my goodness, it has nothing to do with it. Well, these are the Pendergrass. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's not all of them. Yeah. Well, Actually, I are. discovered almost to my horror that not counting the people they have married, we now have 42 direct descendants. That's wonderful. Oh, it's fun. I wouldn't throw any of Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for today.